Just before the break, Susan asked about vouchers. Choice, as they prefer to call it oh, down in Nashville. Oh, however you want. <laughs> vouchers, some of us aren't for it. Choice or educational savings accounts. What about the Senate? Ken, I know it had passed in the Senate before. And there, I don't think there would be any reason that it won't pass again. And I think the earlier comments correct. Uh, I think there's, from what I'm hearing, there's a, still a conversation going on internally of whether we're going to do it this year or next year. And um, and, uh, and I really think that we may see more, we may see it next, next year, but, year, but there is strong support for that in the Senate. If, if, if history teaches us anything, uh, there were probably only uh, half a dozen to eight votes opposed to it in the mm -hmm. Senate. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to tie back into something that, frankly, both of the senators have some interest in. It makes some sense. And Jason, feel free to weigh in if uh, you have a thought. Ken, you're very much for the sort of uh, uh, distressed counties, rural counties, as you mm -hmm. pointed out. You have two in your district. And Richard, you were a strong proponent on the Republican side of the Insure Tennessee program uh, last year of Governor Haslam. And we've seen almost, it seems weekly, but small rural hospitals closing, health care diminishing in probably your district as well. And I'm curious to whether... Uh, I know obviously in short Tennessee was Governor Haslam's baby, so to speak, but is there going to be something meaningful come through the legislature, and Jason, your side of the House as well, that, that will sort of shore up or get closer to what Governor Haslam was trying to propose? Ken, I'll start with you because it affects your district really significantly. It does. I have uh, six rural hospitals mm -hmm. in my district. Uh, and that I, I visit regularly and watch closely. And, and How many were there when you started? I haven't lost any. Uh, Scott County closed yeah. uh, for a while and reopened. Right. Uh, so I, I, I still have the six that I started with. But uh, it is a real important issue. But And, and I think you're going to see some innovative suggestions come out of the legislature. I know uh, 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 Senator Bailey uh, has brought a bill that will ask the governor to direct the governor to seek a waiver to change the way we finance uh, health care uh, for the indigent through the, a block grant to turn the money in the form of a block grant back to the state and let us come up with our own program and and i know when when the when the uh, senator filed that bill there was a, 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 a rush of publicity about it and we, we we got to talking about how we wanted to spend the money, but right now the issue in front of us is to ask the governor to do the waiver to get the block grant. And then we, as a state, will come up with our own plan, maybe even to reach some of the people that were not reached uh, uh, under the proposals of the Affordable Care Act. But Richard, no guarantee that the federal government will actually do that. Uh, we, we haven't asked for it yet, so we don't have that guarantee. You're the expert in this, Richard. Your thoughts? I think a straight block grant could be financially dangerous to the state. It could put the state at risk. But we can have things like per capita cap block grants where you see receive so much per head. The problem is, is when the inevitable recession comes, if we have a straight block grant, we're going to get into trouble because you're going to have more and more people requiring Medicaid, you're going to have less and less revenue, and that mm -hmm. difference uh, could put us into some financial jeopardy. With a, with a per capita cap, and there's many, many conditions that I could spend the next 10 minutes talking about, when there's more people going into the Medicaid as the economy slows down, we also have a way to have more revenues coming from the federal government to help pay for it. The second part that I think we're going to need to do is we would have to get a waiver on some of these minimal essential benefits as part of the Affordable Care Act. The only one that we really need to have control over deals with some of the pharmacy benefits, though, because that's where that's what really killed mm -hmm. uh, the 10 care program when we pretty much had universal uh, insurance in Tennessee back in 2000, 2005, 2006, when Governor Bredesen was our governor. Is there anything we can do now? Because there are a lot of hardworking people that simply can't get or afford health care. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. And I would like to point out this has not only been uh, a problem in rural counties. Uh, fortunately right. for Senator Yeager, he's not had any hospital close in his counties. Mm -hmm. In my county, we've had two major medical centers close. Okay. 
Jason, do you have any thoughts about it and well, what the House might put forward? Yeah, and I'll, and I'll approach it maybe from a different angle because I sit on the Ten Care Subcommittee or the Ten Care Oversight Committee, and the challenges that we have right now, we have lost $41 million in funding for the federal government related to Ten Care. We're actually punished as a state. The better your state does, the faster incomes rise. You actually lose money from the federal government. And so we're already doing all we can to keep Ten Care under that 35% of the entire budget. And so our budget is stretched now. We've lost an additional $41 million. So the key, it, and the role has actually grown slightly. But we, we have made progress as a state because we've gone in the last five years, we've gone from around 14% without insurance. Now we've gone under 10%. We're about 9.5% without insurance. And uh, some in some aspects of 10 care, we've had about 26,000 people roll off. But that's largely attributable to the Affordable Care Act. And, well, and, well, and the economy. It, the the, the Affordable economy. Care Act is a piece, but the economy is a big driver is that, is, of that as well. May, may I jump in? Please do. One, one thing that I would like to see the governor do, and I haven't asked him, but I will, it's, it, is, you know, every county in this state has a health department. Many of those counties have primary, they offer mm -hmm. primary care services. Number one, we need to be encouraging our citizens to use, who don't have health insurance or, or other access otherwise, to use access to primary care at our health departments. But I really would like to see the state uh, uh, in those counties where it, the, the health department doesn't offer primary care, maybe to expand those services. And it, it's a mystery to me why we have never used uh, that existing network in every county of the state to provide primary care. That's just an interest of mine. Well, somebody, real quick, somebody has to pay for it. In Knox County, uh, we do right. have charitable care that's given by Dr. Kim's clinic. Right. We have Interfaith yeah. Health Clinic. We have Cherokee. And then for specialty care, we have available the Knoxville Area Project Access, where those organizations can refer to them to get the specialty care, surgery, whatever that people may need. So in Knox County, we're pretty well covered. And we do have, we, we, we adopted, the legislature adopted a bill last year and enacted into law uh, the and in appropriated the necessary funds for the, the Department of Economic and Community, Community Development to hire the, ne the necessary consulting expertise to assist local hospitals in maybe taking a look at their business plan. You know, some of, the, some of our local hospitals are still running on a business plan that's 40 years old when the demographics in those communities mm -hmm. was very different than now. We're going to take another quick break on Inside Tennessee. Back with more right after this.